Right, you have joined the Willamette Valley System Injunction Deep Drawdown presentation. Uh, shortly, I'll be introducing our presenters for today. Uh, I'll also let you know that we will have a short Q&A session at the end of uh, the meeting. So in the last about 15 minutes uh, to provide questions for that Q&A, please type in any questions you have into the chat. You can look into the lower uh, right hand corner to find that chat button. And those chats will go directly to me. All chats are going to me as the host. And then I'll be reading them off at, during the Q&A session for our presenters to respond to at that time. With that, I will hand it over to Dustin Bankston, our Deputy Operations Manager for the Willamette Valley System and Rogue River System. Here we go, Kelly, can you hear me okay? okay. I can, loud and clear. Right. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Dustin Bankston, I'm the Deputy Operations Project Manager for the Willamette and the Rogue Basin Projects. Um, I'll be providing a little bit of information today. You'll also be hearing from Greg Taylor, uh, fish biologist uh, who's been involved uh, in the basin for a number of years, as well as Catherine Tackley, as we try to kind of walk through. Uh, we'll start with a little bit of background just to, to bring everybody up to speed from how we got here to current. Uh, talk a little bit about um, our overall um, efforts this over this last year to improve on um, our drawdown operations and coordinate uh, with folks downstream. Uh, and then we'll, uh, as Kelly mentioned, have some time to, to talk about uh, or answer questions at the end. Next slide, Kelly. And we'll just go past the orientation slide. Next slide. So our background. Um, I just want to provide a, a quick reminder to folks. I think it's important to, to always be conscious of the fact that we operate the Willamette Valley as a system. Now you'll notice Lost Creek and Applegate is on this slide, just for folks' awareness. Uh, we also uh, are responsible for Lost Creek and Applegate working out of the Willamette. Uh, but the Willamette projects, uh, going back to Fern Ridge, which was completed in 41, and Blue River that was brought online in 1969, we operate uh, those projects within the authorities that we have, uh, flood risk management being a primary authority, but uh, hydropower, recreation, municipal industrial use, fish and wildlife, all of those purposes and those benefits uh, we, we are how we operate this system and trying to maximize once we've reduced the risk to flooding downstream, um, the benefits that these projects can provide. Next slide, Kelly. We, we do that uh, in, in terms of our annual operations in largely similar ways, and this is a generic version of our water control diagram. You may hear this referred to as a rule curve. Each project has one that looks slightly different uh, based on the, the, the structure itself, the hydrology, the basin. Uh, and it's part of that authorization. Uh, it's a legal authorization in how we operate. But they operate in similar ways. And most of you are familiar, but in case you're not, if you look at the, the months of the year on the bottom and then the seasons that we operate through on the top, you know, in, in January and February, as we start to, to uh, work our way out of major flood season, we slowly start to bring these pools back uh, up to what we would call our maximum conservation levels in early part of May. The idea of storing as much water as we can uh, for, the, for the authorities that we have and to provide benefits while complying with legal requirements. Uh, we store as much water as we can, and then we use that water over the conservation season that typically runs from June until late September, and then begin to bring those pools back down again uh, to try to increase as much, uh, or give ourselves as much storage capacity uh, as we can as we enter major flood season. We've operated that way in, 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 for the most part since the dams were constructed. Um, but in the last 20 years or more, we've certainly gone through some changes in how we operate the system to try to improve on conditions downstream or uh, to improve conditions for federally listed species. And I mentioned earlier that legal requirements and, and some of those efforts uh, based on ESA species that we have have certainly modified the actual operation for us. And we'll talk a little bit more about those in specifics uh, around Lookout Point and Green Peter a little bit later. 
Next slide. So just a bit of history. So going back to 2008, uh, where we had a biological opinion that identified a number of actions for us uh, in terms of improvements for water quality, for habitat, uh, to gain understanding through research monitoring and evaluation, and then some measures to improve uh, fish passage for adults upstream and juveniles downstream. And, and we worked for a number of years through that, and in March of 2018, uh, we, a complaint was filed by plaintiffs alleging violations of the Endangered Species Act uh, and a failure to fully implement the biological opinion. In 2018, in, in that same time frame, we reinitiated um, ESA consultation and an update of the project environmental impact statement. And I think that there has uh, you know, been some maybe overlap or confusion on injunction operations versus what we are doing to uh, update the project uh, EIS, and and right now what we're going to spend our time talking about today is going to be compliance with that court injunction. Uh, in August of 2020, the court ruled in favor of the plaintiffs on all those claims, and really since that time we have been working to define and implement uh, the judge's uh, injunction ordering us to carry out those specific measures and improve fish passage and water quality in the basin. That ruling has the full effect of law, and we are going to comply with the law uh, and any actions that we take uh, to modify um, or, or somehow change the operations that, that we're entertaining have to be worked and have been worked back through the court. And they will remain in place unless the judge grants relief or until we complete uh, an updated biop, which I'll talk about in a second. And so since last year, since the injunction uh, measures that, that we're here really to talk about in specifics today, the deep drawdowns at Lookout Point and at Green Peter happened, we've been working with the court to, um, to modify the operation and try to improve in areas that we can um, this year's operations. And again, we'll speak to that in specifics in a little bit. Next one, Kelly. So just a kind of a general reminder of what some of these measures are. Um, one is to complete the, the reinitiation of the ESA consultation and issue a new biop. And that work is ongoing right now. Uh, we expect to see a biop uh, close to the end of this calendar year, and that will give us a lot more clarity. And at that time, we'll be communicating out on what those measures are um, moving forward. But we've been implementing a number of other operational measures, including um, spill operations when the pool's high in that conservation season to try to move fish successfully downstream, and delaying refills to try to, uh, to change and, again, improve upon our fish passage um, for getting juveniles downstream of the dams. We're out planting adult spring chinook above green peter. And then there were a number of structural measures as well. Uh, the Dexter uh, Adult Fish Collection Facility is, is under construction right now. Uh, the expectation is that will be complete in 2026. We're working uh, and will be working in 25 on structural improvements below Big Cliff Dam to improve water quality and reduce total dissolved gas. And then continuing to work on improvements to Cougars regulating outlets uh, to improve conditions for fish passage there. All of these things really using existing structures and existing routes of passage to try to improve condition for listed species. Uh, and, and, um, and Greg will speak to operational fish passage a little bit later. In addition to that, we're working uh, to understand the, the benefits and, and how we can improve on these operations through research, monitoring, evaluation. Um, we're working in really tight windows to uh, minimize the impacts of our operations and our maintenance activities on these listed species uh, and, and following those protocols. Uh, and then all of this gets summarized, uh, has been getting summarized in a biannual status report um, detailing our compliance back to the court. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have links and information where folks can go and, and that information is publicly available. So with that, uh, I'm going to transition this over to Greg Taylor and he can talk a little bit about the mechanics of operational fish passage and a little bit of what we learned in year one. Greg? Greg, if you're talking, we can't hear you.
apologies. I need to unmute him. I apologize. This is my fault. Just have to find him in the meeting participants list. Okay, sorry, folks. This is our first run through on the technical side. So there you go. You should have a request, Greg. Apologies, that was me. All right. There you are. Right. You got her. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for for being here, and I'll just do a a little bit of background on some of the fish pieces of this. Uh, I think important context here to to start with is just when we're going to do anything to try to improve conditions for fish at the dams. I think it's really important to put that in context. Um, actions that we'll take are always, always going to have a set of impacts and a set of benefits. And, and really the key here is then to assess those impacts, those benefits, and make a decision, you know, around uh, trade-offs, and whether or not, um, you know, taking that particular action is is the right path forward. So, um, you know, and these trade-offs can happen um, between things we're trying to do to help fish and our other authorized purposes, whether that's reduce hydropower or recreation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they can, there can be trade-offs between species. Uh, an action we take uh, for a particular fish species uh, may have impacts on, on on other fish species. And then even within a fish species, um, we can have uh, both benefits or, or impacts associated with uh, a particular action where, say, an action we take helps an adult fish, and yet that same action can have potential impact on, on a juvenile. So it's really important as you kind of, as we look to figure out what are the right things to do um, operationally to improve conditions for fish, that we kind of work through this process and, and try to figure out, um, you know, the best path forward. Next slide. So one of the tools in our toolbox, and we don't have a very extensive toolbox uh, for trying to help fish with the existing infrastructure, but we do have some things. And one of those tools is deep reservoir drawdowns. And I'm gonna spend a little bit more time talking about those, uh, obviously, given, given the topic for today. Uh, we're doing operational, we're these drawdowns at a number of locations, uh, Cougar, Fall Creek, Lookout Point, and Green Peter. Um, Three of those operations are what we call partial reservoir drawdowns. So we're drawing the pool down. There's still a residual reservoir. Uh, the, the fourth one at Fall Creek, we're drawing that one down all the way to stream bed. So it's slightly different than the other three. Um, but this is a tool that's been used uh, for a long time out of the Willamette Project. Uh, the first drawdown of Fall Creek was in 1968. Um, so we didn't we didn't come up with this last week or in 2021. Uh, it's it's been used as a tool out here for a very long, long time. Um, you know, in in, in our case, um, after the the finding um, in the litigation, you know, we we really needed to look at things we could do uh, to try to improve both passage and and water quality, and and these deep reservoir drawdowns. Um, were a thing that we thought would result in some improved downstream passage and survival of these fish that we're, we're trying to improve the status of in the Willamette Basin. Um, we are <clears throat> going to be using this particular tool uh, for the foreseeable future uh, at different locations around the Willamette project. Next slide. So let me talk about the next three slides kind of walk you through the kind of physical hows, and then it, it also gives you some why. So um, this could be generically a number of the dams in the Willamette, but um, in this case, this is, um, you know, Green Peter Dam, you want to think of it that way. Uh, and when our, res when our reservoirs are full, as just Dustin described that rule curve, um, we have access to a spillway gate. So in the spring and the summer, you'll see us spilling water from a number of the projects, uh, Lookout, Green Peter, Detroit. And under that scenario, we're really getting two fish benefits. 
One is we're passing warmer water downstream and that improves conditions, uh, uh, temperatures downstreams of the dam, which is a good thing. The second thing we get is, is downstream fish passage. And the reason is these juvenile Chinook that are uh, the targets of these operations are relatively surface oriented fish. They're living um, typically in the top 50 feet of the water column. And so uh, when, it's, when our reservoir is full, we're in, in close proximity to the spillway gate, um, these fish can find their way out through the spillway gate. And the spillway is a relatively safe route for fish out of the dam. So that's the preferred operation in the spring and summer. But as we draw the pool down, next slide, Kelly. At Green Peter, we're really left with just kind of two options. Uh, for fish to pass downstream, uh, fish that remain in the reservoir uh, that we still want to pass downstream. And really those two routes are one through the turbine unit or two through the regulating outlet gate structure. And so because at this particular project, um, the turbine unit is a high head Francis unit, it's got relatively low survival associated with it. It's, it's really not a viable route, um, not in terms of survival. And so uh, that really leaves us with the regulating outlet. And so the regulating outlet is, is the safe potential route out for fish. The trick there then is to make sure that we draw the pool down so that fish can ultimately find that safe route out. Next slide, Kelly. And so at Green Peter, uh, Lookout Point, uh, what, we're, what we're targeting with this particular operation is to be within about 25 feet uh, of that particular outlet so that fish can effectively find their way out. And we've learned that over time, uh, operating a number of different uh, intake structures. Um, generally, fish will pass starting around 100 feet on uh, the passage, and this is juvenile salmonids. Uh, the passage gets better uh, and better at 50 feet, and then, um, you know, even better at something like 25 feet. And of course, the ultimate would be to draw something down completely uh, to stream bed like we do at Fall Creek. So um, that's kind of the rationale for this and, and why um, we're <clears throat> using this particular tool as a, as a passage tool. Uh, next slide. So I'm gonna give you just some really broad brush um, findings from, from 2023 and, and what we did at, at Fall Creek, or excuse me, at Green Peter. Uh, first of all, I, I know there's a number of people that, that care a lot about the, the sport fishery associated with kokanee salmon that lived in Green Peter Reservoir. Um, and I think most people are tracking that we passed large numbers of those fish during this drawdown operation last year. I think because of that and just the observations and just knowing the mechanisms that are kind of in place, I think it's very unlikely that uh, we'll be able to maintain uh, that kokanee sport fishery. Now, that's ultimately a decision um, for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, they'll, they're working on this and trying to assess uh, what the options are. Um, but I think, you know, given how effective the drawdown is at passing fish, it'd be very difficult um, to maintain kokanee in the reservoir. Um, juvenile Chinook salmon, the fish that we tested had relatively high fish passage efficiency. Um, about 90% of those test fish um, passed downstream. Uh, survival is, is higher than what you'd expect for the unit. Um, it was around 70% on those same test fish. And then uh, the naturally produced fish, which are really the target of, of the operation itself, uh, the numbers of Chinook that we saw captured in screw traps was, was pretty low, uh, very low. Um, and so the, obviously not the result we'd, we'd want to see. Um, but everything about this, uh, I think that what's important here is that we're going to build up data over time. So we're going to do this for a number of years. Uh, we're going to see if these kind of trends continue. Uh, we'll add to the data over time, and eventually that will give us kind of a holistic picture of, of how this operation is performing. 
But the two key things, both the fish passage efficiency and survivable, um, those were relatively what I expected to see um, and indicate that we're on the right path with, with the drawdown. Next slide. And we've got extensive monitoring in place. Uh, the ARM and E plan was was uh, drafted by the expert panel that <clears throat> worked uh, designing some of these operations uh, as part of the court. And so that's available to anybody. Anybody can look at that uh, and see, you know, kind of what's planned. Uh, we're, we're focused on a whole bunch, uh, collecting a whole bunch of data uh, in a variety of ways to try to make sure we can really try to nail down the effectiveness of these operations um, and, and make sure we have good information going forward to make decisions as we move forward. And I think that's what I have for fit. Okay, great. This is Catherine Tackley. I'm the Water Quality League for the Portland District. Uh, can I, Kelly, maybe you can confirm that you can hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'm off of mute. <laughs> okay, I also work in the reservoir regulation section, so with the folks that um, schedule the operations at the dam. So, next slide, please. I'll start with um, what we can expect from the drawdown at Green Peter. I'll talk a little bit about uh, expected turbidity and then I'll shift over to lookout point. Um, so this slide is, is pretty data intensive, so uh, bear with me while, while I unpack the details. This is the deep drawdown plan for Green Peter for 2024. Um, on the left, you have pool elevation. Uh, on the bottom axis, you have uh, months starting in January, going through a uh, portion of, of December. The, uh, the dark line that looks like a flat topped pyramid, that's our original rule curve that Dustin talked about at the beginning of this presentation. The dashed line is our injection curve. So that is, um, that is the goal for the deep drawdown at Green Peter. Uh, the maroon purple, purplish line is observed reservoir elevation, so where we have been. And then the colored lines, they're sort of greenish blue uh, that follow that dashed injunction uh, line, that's the forecast to draw down. So we use models uh, that, that take into account uh, previous water year conditions to forecast uh, what the drawdown will look like. We adjust outflows uh, to try and meet that that targeted injunction uh, drawdown rate. Um, for your aware, just uh, you can see it, there's some dashed lines that go from left to right across the plot, uh, the graphic here. Those are the various uh, boat ramps. And so you can see um, that we will be losing the lowest boat ramp at Green Peter Reservoir Thistle boat ramp um, here uh, relatively soon. One thing I want to point out is this deep drawdown plan looks very different from last year's plan. If you've been uh, keeping up with the news, you may be aware that uh, we did uh, file a motion with the court to modify the Green Peter deep drawdown that was granted by the judge. And the reason for uh, a revised deep drawdown plan is to uh, improve the impacts observed last year. Uh, water temperature and, and potentially turbidity. So uh, we're drafting, we've held the reservoir higher this year than we did in 2023, uh, and then we'll draft a little more quickly. The plan is still to achieve uh, that lowest elevation of 780 uh, by the middle to first, uh, middle of November to the first of December, hold for 30 days if possible, and then start with refill. Refill isn't shown on this plot, but is something that I want to touch on. Um, we, like I said, we will refill after 30 days of holding the reservoir at elevation 780 if possible. I say if possible because Mother Nature certainly does come into play here. If you recall, recall last year, um, we were to hold the reservoir uh, till roughly 15 December, but we ended up refilling Green Peter early um, and very quickly. 
and why is that? Well, it's because we um, experienced a few very, very heavy rain events and inflows picked up quickly and uh, we absorbed some of those inflows so as to reduce downstream flooding. So uh, flood risk reduction, flood management is still a very important part of these operations. And at any point in time, um, if, if flooding is a possibility, we will halt or stop the drawdown and begin refilling to avoid downstream or reduce downstream flooding. So um, refill may happen within days, like last year, or it may gradually happen over the course of a month or a month and a half. Or a month and a half. It will really depend on what sort of rain events we get uh, later this winter. The last thing I want to point out is the gold uh, shaded area uh, based on 2023. We anticipate uh, elevated turbidity to begin when we draft roughly below uh, elevation 890 at Green Peter. That's what we saw last year. Um, and we can anticipate elevated turbidity throughout the, the drawdown um, operation. Next slide, please. Speaking of turbidity, I wanted to show a graphic of turbidity measured last year. So um, the left side of this plot is 2023 information. And then as you move to the right, you come up to present day. Um, the axis uh, shows turbidity in FNU. And as you can see last year, as we are all aware, we saw very high turbidity uh, during the drawdown of Green Peter Dam. Um, that's that first spike. And then during that series of very heavy rain events, which is the second spike, we refilled uh, back to almost minimum conservation pool or typical winter pool elevation uh, around early December. And uh, turbidity gradually settled out. Um, by the time we got into the beginning of, of the calendar year, Turbidity was back to almost background levels and has remained low ever since. As we move into uh, our deep drawdown state at Green Peter, we anticipate uh, turbidity to climb um, possibly to similar levels seen last year. Next slide, please. Okay, here is a similar plot. This one is of Lookout Point Reservoir, and this is the, the deep drawdown plan for Lookout Point uh, for 2024. Again, reservoir elevation on the left, time across the bottom. Um, the purple line, again, is where we have been. The colored lines, which lay on top of that dashed injunction curve, um, are where we're headed, so uh, forecasted drawdown. As you can see for lookout point, uh, we are lower in the reservoir than at Green Peter Reservoir. Um, we have not modified the drawdown plan for lookout point in 2024 as compared to 2023. The reason for that is there are some, um, there is some ongoing monitoring uh, landslides uh, on sections of uh, the reservoir REM that we continue to monitor um, and we want to collect additional information before potentially changing the drawdown at lookout point and uh, increasing draft rates uh, like, like what we're doing this year at Green Peter. So uh, what you see here is essentially what we, what we carried out in 2023. Um, we are definitely entering um, uh, the time when we expect to see elevated turbidity. Um, however, if we go to the next slide, you can see that turbidity is, is still quite low. Um, I was out at Lookout Point Dam last week with uh, a variety of folks um, from the region and conditions were still quite clear. Um, what that suggests is that the river that was cut in the upper part of the reservoir last year is finding the, the channel that it worked so hard to create last year, and we're seeing less material come down, uh, you know, liberate and move downstream. Um, so that may be uh, that may be positive indication that turbidity could be lower this year. Um, however, we still do expect elevated turbidity as we draft lookout point uh, to the targeted elevation of 750. 
similar to Green Peter, will hold re the reservoir at elevation 750 for 30 days unless Mother Nature chooses otherwise, and then we'll begin our, our, our refill. Refill timing, again, will be dependent on those rain events and inflows, uh, but we will try to refill as, as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. Okay, let's touch on a little bit of monitoring. Next slide, please. Uh, we're carrying out additional monitoring last year as compared to last year. Last year, we funded the USGS to um, monitor turbidity in seven locations. This year, we've increased that to 11. Um, we're not only uh, monitoring turbidity in real time, but also water temperature in some places, dissolved oxygen. And then we're also funding the USGS to collect suspended sediment concentration data. All of this information um, will be used to inform current conditions as well as uh, provide data for some numer numerical or computer models that we're using um, that will, that will uh, give us the ability to predict turbidity and sediment transport in these reservoirs in the future. Next slide, please. In addition to the real-time monitoring and suspended sediment uh, sampling, we also collected sediment samples uh, earlier uh, last month in Green Peter and Foster Reservoirs. Um, the, this map shows the sediment sampling that we conducted in 2013. Those are the red dots uh, here at Green Peter. And then the yellow dots are where we uh, pulled samples in 2024. You can see we changed locations just slightly based on where we saw sediment movement last year during the 2023 drawdown. We shipped these sediment samples off to the lab and uh, just received results. And while the data is preliminary, it shows that data is, is uh, clean and below any thresholds of concern for heavy metals or pesticides. Next slide, please. This next slide is a map of Foster. We also collected uh, data and sediment samples in Foster Reservoir. Um, again, the red dots show the 2013 sampling sites. The yellow dots show the 2024 sampling sites. And again, all data that re we've received uh, back from the lab shows that, that heavy metal and pesticide contamination is very low and below thresholds of concern. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide. For everyone's awareness, um, we have improved our Willamette Injunction website. Uh, there's a link and a QR code where you can access this website. You can also just Google Willamette Injunction and it should bring you to this website. Uh, this website includes all the details on uh, the court order, our implementation plans, um, all of the biannual status reports that we've written. We have written now six that have been submitted to the court. Um, and most importantly, you can find current reservoir elevation data and links to real-time turbidity data. Um, there's also a, a nice um, fact sheet um, that describes in very simple terms the drawdowns uh, for Green Peter and Lookout Point. So I encourage you to check this site often, look at the data, uh, and stay informed. Next slide, please. Okay, so in summary, uh, the court, as you know, is under, uh, excuse me, the core is under a court in order to draw down Green Peter and Lookout Point reservoirs, as well as carry out other operations for improved downstream fish passage and water quality. Uh, deep drawdowns are expected to provide improved downstream fish passage as uh, Greg was discussing, and we certainly continue to carry out biological and uh, other monitoring to better understand the impacts of the drawdowns. The deep drawdowns will result in elevated turbidity. Uh, we, uh, like I said, collected samples that indicate sediment is clean and below toxicity screening levels. Um, and we are monitoring all of that information in real time where you can, and you can find that data on that website I just showed. And refill of the reservoirs back to typical winter elevations is expected by early February, if not sooner. And 
as mentioned, the reservoir refill is dependent on rain events and that inflow. Um, and once we've reached uh, minimum conservation pool, uh, we'll begin to follow our, our regular rule curve um, that was showed at the beginning of the presentation uh, and begin refilling starting on February 1 in order to reach full reservoir levels um, by, by May and certainly by Memorial Day weekend. Um, let's hope for not a, let's, let's hope for a healthy water year. Um, that certainly helps us uh, reach our refill goals. And again, that real-time reservoir ele elevation information is publicly available. Just go to that Willamette Injunction website. Next slide, please. Okay, lastly, I just wanted to mention we are, uh, have been working on an emergency response plan. Um, the purpose of this plan is to identify criteria for implementing notification and response procedures that not only the cities can, um, can follow, but the state and the core will also undertake uh, related to adverse impacts of the deep drawdowns on, on municipal drinking water facilities located downstream at Green Peter and Lookout Point. So this emergency response plan is a work in progress and it's something that we continue to work with our partners at the cities and state on. Um, we, are, we are carrying out um, uh, biweekly meetings with the cities and the state. Those are going to increase to weekly um, so that we can continue to track conditions altogether and follow the, the process as laid out in this plan. And I just wanna end with uh, in, 2000, in 2023 drinking water Providers were able to provide adequate and safe drinking water to their communities. And uh, we certainly um, uh, hope and um, think that we'll continue to, to provide safe drinking water uh, in 2024. I think that is the last slide and uh, we can open it up for a question and answer. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much to our presenters and thank you all for joining us today and taking time to hear about this important initiative. I'm going to move into the Q&A session part of the presentation. Uh, reminder that this whole webinar is being recorded and you will be able to access the recording on our webpage shortly after uh, the meetings this week. We have two additional meetings and all recordings will be posted probably in the next week or so. So if you know folks that aren't able to make it and would like to hear about this, they can access those and, and review all of the presentations as well as all the Q&A sessions. So moving into the Q&A, um, there was one comment actually from one of our core employees that they wanted folks to know that the Thistle Creek boat ramp was closed last Friday Lynn County Parks uh, told us that the ramp is unusable below 920. Current elevation is 917. All right, so moving on to the questions. Uh, the first question actually was where can we review this video? And so I've posted up uh, the location of the website where the videos will be eventually posted. I believe we actually have um, on the next slide, maybe you'll go forward, Jeff. Yep, this QR code, and then you can see, oh, it's almost illegible on this site, but if um, the website is there as well. And if you Google Willamette Valley Injunction uh, USACE, it will likely show up at the top of your search bar. All right, the next question is, have any EIS been conducted prior, during, and or after the green, the first Green Peter drawdowns, if no EIS was conducted, then why not? So I'll hand it over to uh, Dustin or Catherine Tackley if you'd like to respond. Yeah, Sarah, and, and I'll do my best to respond to it, but I, and I mentioned it briefly at the beginning. I remember that the injunction and the operations that we are uh, implementing now are part of a court order. So there was no, as you, as you correctly stated, no NEPA process. Uh, we are complying with uh, the judge's order in this process. Um, moving forward, and, and I want to separate, distinguish between injunction and then this transition to long-term operations, there is uh, an, an EIS process underway. 
The next step in that process would be, uh, you know, the biological opinion, the updated biological opinion, followed by um, completing the EIS that's been in process for a couple of years now. So where we are today with injunction implementation, the answer to your question is no, there was not uh, a NEPA process associated with it. Uh, we, are, we are complying with the law. Did I miss anything there, Kelly? Uh, nope. I believe that answers the question. Uh, Sarah, if you'd like some uh, clarifications, please put them in the chat and I'll, I'll, I'll put those up. Uh, next question is um, general information on Lookout Point, lessons learned from last year's uh, drawdown at Lookout Point, the effect on nature at Lookout Point, and the effect on the residents in the area. Kelly, why don't you let me start with this one, and then I may lean on Greg a little bit. But um, from the standpoint of lessons learned at Lookout Point, obviously similar to uh, what we saw at Green Peter, uh, we, we had uh, turbidity in the system and learned some things from that. We have been actively monitoring uh, historic slide areas along Highway 58, uh, the concern being the, the rail line and then the, the highway itself. We saw, uh, uh, we didn't see any significant issues in year one of that, but that will be a long-term monitoring effort for us. Uh, we're also doing some enhanced monitoring on the dam. The two dams themselves are different in terms of construction. so. We're monitoring both, uh, and that's a, another reason why you didn't see a modification to the lookout point drawdown this year. Um, we were aware, and I think it came up in multiple areas, that there were a couple of shallow wells uh, for residents up along Highway 58, uh, and they had issues with production in those wells uh, during the drawdown. We have not heard similar reports this year. I know. Uh, in one case, the individual um, had his well deepened or, or drilled a new well. But I have not heard any uh, new reports in terms of the impacts that way this year. And again, the turbidity impacts, uh, I think there's reasons to be cautiously optimistic. Obviously, every year is different. Uh, but this year, uh, we're not seeing the early turbidity. Obviously, we've got a dry season, uh, but we, we would expect some improvement over time, as we've said, in, in different areas. Greg, anything to speak to with regards to kind of uh, environmental other uh, impacts from a fisheries standpoint um, at Lookout Point? No, I think based on, you know, how we've been able to use these drawdowns as tools, um, you know, we expect them to perform similarly at Lookout uh, as Green Peter, as Fall Creek, at Cougar, all these places we've been implementing them. Uh, we're collecting specific data, obviously, at that site. Uh, we've got similar operations in place. Ultimately, we'll probably want to move towards, and at some point, um, an operation that looks a little more like the Green Peter operation uh, at Lookout Point. We're not there yet, so um, no, I don't. I don't have anything to add. All right. Um... Going to the next question, how much sediment slash turbidity is expected this year compared to last year at Green Peter? Hey, Catherine, yeah. could you speak a little bit to um, sediment mon monitoring, modeling, excuse me? Yes, yeah, sure. So, um, you know, a model is as good as the data that goes into it. Um, we're just starting to build these models and um, push data into the models that are gonna help answer these specific questions. Um, so uh, we don't have a, a tremendous amount of, of information yet in these models. Um, what, we have, um, what we have estimated is that we'll see turbidity levels similar to last year. Um, that said, uh, I will say that, you know, we are, lookout point of course is, is ahead of the Green Peter drawdown. Um, lookout point is um, this time last year, um, we were seeing higher turbidity levels given the elevation that we're at. Uh, we're seeing reduced turbidity this year, which is very encouraging. Um, like I said, the river, I think, is, is finding um, the path that it cut last year. A lot of the tur turbidity um, that we saw last year was from um, that reservoir converting back to a river at the upper end of the watershed. And in doing so, that river had to find a path. And so it cut through, what, 70 plus years of, of sediment that moved downstream 
Um, if that river finds the same channel last year, uh, we're likely to see less sediment, uh, less turbidity move downstream. Um, but but all, indica all indications and all modeling that at this point suggest that it, it is going to take some time to, um, to clear turbidity from these reservoirs, um, you know, multiple years of implementing this drawdown. Um, so the message that, that um, we continue to relay to folks is, is expect similar turbidity levels as to last year. Um, while they may be re reduced, it's very, very hard to predict that uh, given um, where we're at in our tool development process. All right, thanks, Catherine. Uh, next question, will turbidity releases exceed state water quality standards when all six drawdowns are operating would expect a combined effect to the main stem? Yeah, this is Catherine. Um, there, there's not six drawdowns. Um, there are four drawdowns, Fall Creek, Cougar, uh, Lookout Point, and Green Peter. Um, we do anticipate elevated turbidity, as I just mentioned. Um, we continue to work with the state of Oregon uh, through multiple agencies, particularly DEQ, um, on uh, best management practices, um, most, mostly increased communication and uh, additional sediment sampling. Um, but we uh, we are con we're learning as we go, right? Um, and and so we'll continue to monitor conditions and and work work with DEQ accordingly. All right. Um, next question is: How can I access the sediment sample reports? Catherine, yeah, I think they will be posted on that website, correct? Yeah, we can absolutely do that. Um, the, the most recent sediment sampling uh, is, is preliminary data. It's still going through a quality assurance, quality check. Um, but as soon as, as that data is, um, is, you know, has been checked and reviewed, uh, we can post that information. Um, like I mentioned during the presentation, you know, we're also meeting with the cities and the states uh, on a regular basis. And we've also, um, you know, promised to, to send that data to them just as, as, as soon as it's ready. So um, two places, I'm not sure if I answered the question. If you work for the state or the city, you'll get it through us directly. Um, otherwise, we can make that publicly avail available on the website that, uh, that I showed earlier today. Uh, next question is just to clarify, the Green Peter drawdown is scheduled to begin November 15th and last till December 15th. The drawdown is not starting in October. Well, it really it really depends on um, what you consider the drawdown. We've been, you know, we we start drawing down um, every summer, right? We use the water stored behind these dams for flow augmentation, for water supply, uh, for fish and wildlife, et cetera. Um, so really, the minute we we start departing from uh, full pool, from full reservoir levels, uh, we're, we're in a draw we're drawing down, right? Mm -hmm. um, we uh, will be draw we will be drawing the reservoirs down below typical winter reservoir elevations um, uh, as soon as next week at Green Peter, um, and we'll continue the drawdown. We will reach that very lowest elevation sometime between 15 November and the 1st of December. And depending on the day we get there, we will hold for 30 days and then start refill. Uh, next question is, what is the expected impact of drawdowns and delayed refills on the availability of stored water to help meet spring and summer flow targets for fish? Yeah, that's a great question um, and something we continue to, to model and evaluate. Um, you know, last year was a healthy water year and we carried out um, uh, everything listed, right? Delayed refills um, as well as the dr these deep drawdowns. Um, and we were able to refill reservoirs um, back to, to targeted elevations and provide adequate uh, flows throughout the, the spring and summer and fall. 
Um, so last year, I think, was a good example of um, when things worked really well. Now, in drought conditions, we may, um, we may see reduced flows during certain times of the year, um, but then again, we've seen that even pre-injunction. Um, when our reservoirs don't fill, we just, you know, we don't have as much storage to meet uh, the flow targets, um, you know, that, 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 are, that we like to see during healthy water years. So, um, we may see some reduced flows in a dry year, but, um, but we certainly um, had no, we had had very little problem meeting those those targets this this past year. All right. Um, I'm going to read off a comment and then um, hopefully our our presenters will be able to provide some uh, input on that comment. Uh, there's one that I think I'll need to unmute just quickly. Um, all right, the comment is trade off of impacts and benefits are supposed to be vetted through the NEPA process with the public. Uh, a court injunction does not relieve a federal agency from NEPA if the core has regulations that says otherwise they should provide that. And I believe, Drew, you should be off mute. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Drew Hancherick. I'm an attorney here in the Office of Council in the Portland District. And yeah, I want to want to go back to something that was stated a couple times uh, here already was the differentiating between uh, the drawdowns conducted under the injunction and injunctions that will be conducted in the future under the EIS and development. So for the for the drawdowns that we're conducting now, uh, pursuant to the injunction, uh, NEPA is not required for those drawdowns because uh, this is a non-discretionary action. And under the NEPA regs, the threshold determination for NEPA review, uh, we need to determine whether the proposed activity or decision is a non-discretionary action with respect to which our agency does not have the authority to take environmental factors into consideration in determining whether to take the action, in this case, the drawdown. So because we're operating under the court order, the judge has told us that we have to do these drawdowns. The judge has told us how we're going to do the drawdowns. So we don't have any, any discretion in how we would go about doing them and whether or not we can do them at all. We have been directed to do them. So because of that, NEPA doesn't apply to this circumstance. Now, we are conducting those sort of reviews under NEPA for the future drawdowns uh, under the EIS, but those will be the ones that take place after this one. Thank you, Drew. Um, next question is, do you foresee the future of Foster and or Green Peter Dam eventually being taken down as seems to be the objective of environmental activists? I know many say it will never happen, but the dams are primarily for flood control, but many will count counterpoint that flood control is not a guarantee the dams will remain. Well, I, I guess maybe I'll, I'll take a stab at this and, and you know, I've worked in the Valley for over 30 years, and I've heard this question come up in, in a number of different places and, and based on different changes in our operations. And, and what I can say is that, you know, we are focused and these, these operations are focused on trying to improve conditions for listed species. Uh, we will continue to follow the law and operate these uh, facilities uh, consistent with the authorities that we have. And I am unaware of any authorization or direction for us to study removal of these dams. Um, these are significant changes in operations, and I certainly understand, given what has been going on in the region and, and some, some dam removal projects where this question would come up. Uh, but I think if you look on balance at the difference between those projects and the Willamette system, uh, the population at risk downstream. Um, I think I think you have you know some some information there to work from, but it's it's something that you know I think it's inappropriate for us to speculate that far out into the future. What I can say 
uh, is that we have no direction to study the removal of these dams. We are very focused on how we operate these dams uh, for the best balances of purpose, uh, you know, of the authorized purposes that we have and, and trying to meet our requirements under the ESA. And Greg or Catherine, if there's anything else I missed in there, feel free to chime in. All right. Um, I only have one more question from the chat. Um, we do have four more minutes, so if anyone has any last questions they would like to get in, please enter them into the chat and I'm happy to read them out. Last question is, why does Foster Reservoir even need to be drawn down 25 feet when Green Peter has already been drawn down to the riverbed? Yeah, this is Catherine. I can take that one. Um, so Foster is, is actually currently drafted to its typical minimum reservoir elevation. So the, the elevation that, that we always draw the foster down to every winter. Um, noticeably though, uh, and I think to your point, is we uh, drafted foster, we have under the injunction, we're ordered to draw down foster earlier in the year. Um, and so that's what you're seeing uh, out there pre at presently. Um, foster is where I think last time I looked with it, um, was was close to minimum conservation pool, I think five feet above roughly. Um, and, and that early drawdown um, is to promote improved downstream fish passage. Uh, we're also uh, using the spillway at night to move fish downstream. So it's, it's not a deeper drawdown at Foster, it's an earlier drawdown to a normal winter uh, reservoir elevation. I haven't received any additional questions. Um, we have a couple more minutes. Oh, there is one more. Uh, I'll read it out loud right now. The core violated ESA and never did need before the implementation of the 2008 buy-up as required. Now that violation has resulted in these unanticipated effects from the deep drawdowns. Now the dam has been operated outside of NEPA. And uh, as it should have been for the 2008, or I think it means 2008 by up and violations to Clean Water Act. So uh, I don't see a question there, but if anyone wants to uh, comment or respond. I don't, I don't know that we would have anything to add to that. I feel like it kind of hit those points and, and Drew's point uh, with regards to our NEPA compliance. Um, I think if there's something that we need to do, uh, Kelly to follow up offline, we can, um, but in terms of, you know, both Drew's response and kind of Catherine's response earlier on our ongoing coordination with the state, I, I don't know what else we can add to that statement. Yep. And uh, if you'll go one last slide over, Jeff. I think there was one more, maybe I'm writing wrong. Oh, yep, there it is. So there are additional public meetings coming up uh, later today from five to six and on Friday from noon to one, the same uh, online URL and access phone numbers, passcodes. Uh, again, you can access the website, which I put in the chat um, or go to this QR code. And we appreciate everyone who's joined us today. This closes out our proceedings. I will end recording now. Thank you.